That love is not merely a, an emotion, energy in motion. Love means that I can see you. I see your value. I see your unique value. I see your beauty. So we're going to turn to David now. David's going to resonate the code. And then we're going to go into week three of Avatar. Okay, we're going to go into week three of Avatar. Here we go. David, welcome everyone. Take us inside. Revolution. So here's our code for today. Evolutionary love is not merely an emotion. It is a perception. The evolutionary lover sees with God's eyes. Because love is a perception at its core, a perception that generates emotion, there's great hope in love. The universe sees and the universe sees love the universe feels and the universe feels love seeing generates feeling and feeling generates seeing but we must start with perception because perception can be trained through practice personal human love is a unique self perception personal self love is a perception of one's own unique self However, one cannot be an evolutionary lover with these forms of perception alone. Evolutionary love requires a perception of the entire evolutionary process and our place within it. I'll go ahead and resonate it one more time. So this, is the, this is the new story, evolution of love here. Evolutionary love is not merely an emotion, it is a perception. The evolutionary lover sees with God's eyes. Because love is a perception at its core, a perception that generates a feeling, an emotion, there is great hope in love. The universe sees, and the universe sees love. The universe feels, and the universe feels love. Seeing generates feeling, and feeling generates seeing. But we must start with perception, because perception can be trained through practice. Personal human love is a unique self-perception. Personal self-love is a perception of one's own unique self, one's own unique expression of the evolutionary impulse. However, one cannot be an evolutionary lover with these forms of perception alone. Evolutionary love requires a perception of the entire evolutionary process and our place within it. With that, I will turn my word to you, beloved Dr. Mark. Thank you, David. Wonderful, gorgeous, fantastic. So we're going to go right into this code, okay? This is week three. Madly delighted to be with you. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to look at a clip from a compilation of scenes from Avatar 1 and 2. It's going to be about a minute and 40 seconds. We might then see a couple of those scenes a little bit later slowly, but let's look carefully at this set of scenes. Okay, we read everybody. Take us inside one minute and 39 seconds, which is the compilation of the clips. It's clip nine, clip nine, compilation scene. Those were the ICU scenes from Avatar 2. We're going to go into what those are. Playing the ICU scenes from Avatar 1. Okay, and we're going to put them together. Okay? Give me the ICU scenes from Avatar 1. With us, everyone? So the, the line is ICU. They were hard to see because Avatar 2 is not easily available. So we had to, I don't know where we got it from online, but they're not, they're not good scenes. They're hard to see. So I'm going to explain what they are. But first, take me in, right, brothers and sisters, take me into the Avatar. I see you scenes from Avatar 1. Are we good on that team? This is a very important it's good he's back on board, but he thinks I'm a scoundrel. It's not just I'm, I'm seeing you in front of me. It's I see into Okay, that's one. That's the first I see you scene where Norm is explaining to people why I see you is the big line, right, in the Navi people. Give me the next clip. 
Next one. I want all the ICU scenes from Avatar 1. Let's see them together. Jake! My Jake! One more scene, one more scene. The third I see you scene, when Atiri speaks to Jake and says, I see you before he speaks to the Navi tribe. Okay, let's come together, friends. So first, just because we're home together, I asked for the wrong scene. I asked for clip nine, which is the wrong clip to ask for. Let me explain to you what we just saw. So we saw first clip nine that I asked for was three scenes from Avatar 2. And then we saw scenes from Avatar 1. Let me explain the six scenes we just saw. They're unbelievable. Okay, I see you. Let's see each other. And I'm going to add one scene before, okay? We're not going to see it. I'm just going to describe it to you. So Miles Quattrich, here we go. Everybody ready? Can we have a drum roll? We got a drum roll. We ready to go, everybody? We're going to take these six scenes we just saw. We're going to explain them one by one. You don't need to remember them, right? Drum roll, here we go. Okay. So Miles Quattrich says, Miles Quattrich is the colonel who appears in Avatar 1. He also appears in Avatar 2 already in an avatar body because he's been killed at the end of avatar one and his memories have been downloaded into an avatar body and he's been charged with hunting down and killing jake scully that's our plot line now in avatar one and if you haven't been with us and haven't seen the movie i want to just bring everyone in just for a second so avatar one is the story about planet earth which is desperate need for minerals those minerals live on pandora which is another planet in the galaxy you with me the key mineral is called unobtainium meaning it's not obtainable which is not by accident and earth which is more powerful technologically goes to this other planet in the galaxy to extract their minerals essentially against their will. We're gonna do one more week of Avatar after this week and I'm gonna show you some of the scenes that they took out of Avatar that were, that were, were made and never used and kind of how we got to the situation on Pandora. They're very important scenes, but essentially there's this battle between the Navi people who live on Pandora and Earth and Earth is coming, the human beings, to essentially extract resources. And the Navi people to them are much like animals are to human beings on planet Earth today. Does everyone get that? So we, we use animals for our own means, but we don't view animals as being fully human because animals aren't. But we actually, we actually overreach it's not just animals aren't human animals are animals and they, they do deserve their dignity right but we actually turn animals into objects we cause them torture and suffering on planet earth today we work with animals in factory farms right we create enormous enormous suffering for animals because animals exist to serve us so this human capacity to treat animals as animals 
but, but in the negative way, right? Meaning as animals, meaning not with their own dignity, humans then take the same capacity and apply it this time not to animals, but to other species who are actually equally intelligent to humans. They're not technologically advanced, but they're equally intelligent and actually in many, more, many ways, much more evolved. That's the Navi people. That's just the backdrop in case, just to honor anyone who just came in and hasn't seen any of the Avatar movies, that's the context. Within this context, and now I'm gonna assume that people have, have some knowledge of what's going on here. Let me just dive in. Within this context, there's a scientist named Grace and there's Miles Quatrich, the Colonel. The Colonel, his job is to actually make sure that they can get all the minerals out that they need. And if he needs to massacre Navi people in order to do it, that's what he's going to do. Think about King Leopold of Belgium, a Western democracy, but just 100 years ago, Leopold of Belgium, this is one example, goes to the Congo because they need rubber and other minerals from the Congo, and they massacre, destroy, and butcher the people in the Congo to get those minerals. That happened tragically time and again. So this is now planet Earth replaying that Belgian scene of King Leopold, but King Leopold of Belgium is now the Colonel Miles Quatrich. Everyone get that? That's the scene. Jake Scully begins as a drunk soldier. He has his legs destroyed in a combat mission. He winds up replacing his brother who's died in this Avatar project. And Miles Quatrich says, you be my agent. You get to know the Navi people. Tell me what their weaknesses are. So when the time comes, we can take them out and destroy them so we can get our minerals. That's the story. Grace then says, and it's, we don't have to, I don't have time to show you the scene now, but Grace then says, Dr. Grace, she's the doctor who's researching the Navi. And she actually feels and knows that the Navi have enormous depth and enormous culture and an enormous heart and enormous capacity. And we talked about that last week and the week before, that they're plugged in, that every avatar person, right? Every, excuse me, every Navi person actually participates in the field of knowing and all of the trees and all of nature and all of the valleys and all of the knowledge that lives within the earth and that lives within the Navi. They're exchanging it all the time. It's this field of gnosis. And it's this field of goodness, truth, and beauty, and this field of value that actually the Navi participate in. Grace knows that. So Grace says to Jake, everyone stay close. Grace says to Jake, don't listen to Miles Quatrich. See what they see. Does everyone get this line? If we can catch this line and put it in the chat box, that would be great. See, she says to him, see what they see. And maybe next week we'll be able to look at that scene together. See what they see. Does everyone get that? See what they see. Meaning, learn how to see. And that's the evolutionary love code we just put. Let's put the evolutionary love code in the chat box. Love is a perception. See what they see. See what they see. And so all through Avatar 1, the way to say I love you is I see you. Because there's this understanding that love's not merely, and we're going to talk about this, love's not merely an emotion, that love is a perception. We're going to talk about this in a couple of minutes. But first, I want to go through the scenes. The way that they say, I love you, is I see you because they have this deep understanding, which is at the core of our evolutionary love code, that love is not merely a, an emotion, energy and motion. Love means that I can see you. I see your value. I see your unique value. I see your beauty. I see your goodness, truth, and beauty. I see you. I see through the outside. I see who you are. So I love you. That's our evolutionary love code. means I see you. And there's six scenes that we saw. The first scene that we saw, well, I'm, I'm not going to go in order. I'm going to go first the scenes of Avatar 1, which we saw second, which was my fault. I asked for the wrong clip. So in Avatar 1, we see the first clip is Norm. It's a little... 20 second clip, Norm explains to Jake, Norm is a scientist who works on the team together with Grace. Norm says to Jake, this thing I see you, what they mean by that is I see into you. 
I see your beauty. I see your value. So Norm's explaining to Jake what I see you means. That's number one. Number two, there's another clip. That's the second clip that we saw from Avatar 1. When Jake, who Natiri, Natiri is the son of the chieftains, right? The man and woman who are the heads of the Navi tribe. Natiri is their daughter, this beautiful Navi woman. And Natiri has only seen Jake in his avatar body. She's never seen his human body. The way that it works, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, is that the human being goes into a particular chamber in which they, you merge your consciousness with an avatar body, and then you are actually able to walk. Your consciousness actually animates. You walk in that avatar body. And so Natiri has never seen Jake the human. And Miles Quatrich, in this last battle at the end of Avatar 1, goes to pull the plug on the chamber that Jake's in so that he can kill him because he'll be in his avatar body. He'll be thrown out of his chamber where he's breathing and he'll suffocate because he can't access air because the human being can't breathe the air of Pandora. So a human being needs to be in an avatar body to breathe on Pandora or needs to be wearing a certain kind of mask. Okay, so... Jake is thrown out of his chamber. Natiri saves him and sees him for the first time, literally. But not just literally, she actually sees Jake in his human body. And what she says is, I see you. What she means by I see you is, I don't need your avatar body or your human body. I see your essence. I see your unique self. I see your soul. I see your beauty. I see your goodness. I see your truth. I see you. That's the second I see you scene. The third I see you scene, which we saw from Avatar 1, is when Jake, it's at the two-thirds into Avatar 1, in which the human beings are about to attack and try and destroy the Navi people. Jake arrives, right, riding on this mountain dragon beast called Taruk Makto, which only the great warriors of Navi are able to ride, Jake is able to find Taruk Makto, this bird in the sky, ride Taruk Makto into the Navi camp. By riding Taruk Makto, they have confidence that he's actually with them. And Natiri is blown away. She thought that Jake had betrayed her people. She now realizes she didn't see him. And before he's about to give this major speech as a leader, to her tribe, Natiri says to Jake, I see you. And Jake says to Natiri, I see you. And it means I love you, but I love you not just as a feeling. I see you. I see who you are. I see who you truly are. Then, stay with me. It's very beautiful. This carries through Avatar 2. This carries through Avatar 2, and it's crazy beautiful. So in Avatar 2, there are actually... Three scenes. I'm just going to do each one in 20 seconds. So Spider in Avatar 2 is the son of Miles Quatrich, who's been killed, the colonel. Spider, his son, is a little baby when Miles is killed. Most of the people from Earth are sent off of Pandora, and they're sent back to Earth. But Spider is too young. He's too fragile to make the trip. So he stays in Pandora, and he's raised essentially as one of Jake and Natiri's children. We'll talk about that more next week. But he's completely loyal to the Navi. He gets the Navi ways. At the same time, his biological father is Miles Quatrich, the colonel. Now remember, the colonel's memories have been downloaded into an avatar body after Miles Quatrus is killed, and we open up Avatar 2, realizing that Miles Quatrus is now in an Avatar body. And next week, we're going to talk about that. You get how paradoxical that is, because Miles Quatrus thinks that the, av that, that the Navi, the Avatar bodies are Navi bodies, the, the Pandoran people in Navi, the Avatar bodies are Navi bodies that can breathe Pandoran air. But of course, Miles Quatrus thinks that 
the Navi are subhuman, and all of a sudden he's an avatar body. So what that means and how that affects Miles Quad, which we'll talk about next week. But for now, Spider, who is Miles Quattro's son, is now confronted with this Miles Quattro in an avatar body who still is a bad man. And yet there begins to be something of a relationship between them. The team of Miles Quattro and their avatar bodies take Spider captive at a certain point. But Miles Quattro and his avatar body, it's not really Miles Quattro, it's his memories downloaded in the avatar body, right? Something opens in his heart and he takes Spider with him on their mission. And Spider doesn't help them, he hates them. But even though they're the enemy, he begins to get to know Miles Quattro and his avatar body and he begins to see his bravery. He begins to see something beautiful in him. And there's a particular moment in Avatar 2, and there's a scene like this also in Avatar 1 when Jake gets his Indra. Indra is the mountain beast, the mountain animal that you learn to ride. It's kind of like riding a wild horse, right, in a Western rodeo. So on Pandora, you have to get your mount, your Indra, which is your mountain bird. And it's very hard to do. And there's a beautiful scene in Avatar 1, which is Jake getting his Indra. We should actually compare those scenes at some point, but not today. And then in Avatar 2, Spider explains to Miles Quattro in the Avatar body what this process is of getting your Indra. And then he watches, he watches Miles Quattro in his Avatar body very courageously tame his Indra and create this bond with this mountain bird beast. And there's this moment in which Spider says to Miles Quattrich in the Avatar body, he says, I see you. Meaning for a moment, he's not the enemy. There's a moment when the enemy is no longer the enemy and I can actually see you for a second. That's very deep. It's very profound. Sam Keen wrote a book called The Faces of the Enemy. And he pointed out that in all propaganda posters, the face of the enemy is blanked out. You actually don't see the face. And he did an entire book, maybe 25 years ago, called The Faces of the Enemy. It must be on Amazon, which is about the notion that you never actually see the enemy. The enemy doesn't have a face. So here's this moment in which Spider, who's totally loyal to the Navi, he's been raised by Jake and Natiri. Nonetheless, for a moment, Miles Quattrich and the Avatar body stops being the enemy, and he says, I see you. That's the first scene we saw from Avatar 2, when Miles is riding his Ikran, that Spider, you know, says to him, okay, I see you. And he teaches him how to say, I see you in the Navi language. The second clip we saw, I'm just going to do two more. The second clip we saw is when Loak, let me just introduce this character, Loak in Avatar 2 is, anyone in the chat box, Loak in Avatar 2 is Jake and Natiri's second son. And the, the first son, the older son of Jake and Atiri, he's the model's son, the apple of his father's eye. But his father, Jake, doesn't really understand Loak. So Loak is the renegade. And Loak plays a very important role in all of Avatar 2, which I don't have time to go into. But basically, let's just understand that Jake, Loak's father, is always disappointed with Loak. And Loak feels like his father doesn't understand him and doesn't see him, meaning doesn't love him. And there's a certain moment at the end of the movie in which Loak saves Jake. And Loak actually is the one who's able to make friends in Avatar 2 with the Tulkin. And the Tulkin are the great sea beasts, but these great sea beasts are not beasts. They're actually more evolved than the humans. They do complex mathematics and philosophy and, and music. And they have great love stories. They're far more advanced, far more evolved than humans. And Loak, Jake's son, can actually see the Tolkien. He understands who they are. And there's particularly one Tolkien, one great sea animal, one great sea whale animal that the other Tolkiens don't understand. And Jake actually sees this, this ostracized Tolkien and makes friends with this ostracized Tolkien. And there's this love story, essentially, between Loak Jake and Atiri's son in this ostracized, banished, exiled 
Tulkin, and out of the love between Loa, Jake's son, and this Tulkin, this Tulkin then aids Jake and Atiri at a critical moment in their battle against the humans that actually turns the tide of the battle. So in essence, what Loak is saying to this Tulkin, this sea whale that's been thrown out by the other sea whales that misunderstand this particular Tulkin, he's saying, I see you. And at the end of the movie, when Loak saves his father, Jake, rescues him, all of a sudden, Jake gets who his son is, and he turns to his son and he says, I see you. And finally, the very last scene that we saw was when Syria, and Syria is, right, this, this young girl who says to Loak again, I see you. That's the other scene that we saw. I'll tell you who Syria is. Syria is the daughter of Tonawari and Ronal. And Tonawari and Ronal are the head of the water people. They're called the Medicaina. The Medicaina are the water people. And Natiri's tribe, the Navi, are the Omatikaya. Right? The Omatikaya. So when Jake and Natiri want to escape the humans who are hunting them, they're from the Omatikaya. They're forest people. They go to ask for shelter, for refuge with the water people, the Medicaina. And the daughter of the Medicaina, this beautiful, beautiful girl, Syria, she sees Loak. And even though the water people and the forest people are different, and actually there's a great clash between the sons, Anang, the son of Tonawari and Ronal, who are the chieftains of the water people, Anang, their son, almost has Loak killed because of the competition, because he can't see him. But to Syria, to Syria can actually see him. To Syria sees him and says, I get who you are. I see you. So she's able to see through the fact that he's from the forest people and see his heart. So I see you always means I love you. I see you means I love you. So I'm going to ask everyone, if you can, to actually close your eyes for a second. I'm going to turn off for one second my video, and let's see if we can actually see with our inner eye for a second. And we're just gonna talk just for three minutes before we finish about what this means, I love you, I see you. Because we're at this moment in which we're about to step into an intergalactic world. We're gonna step beyond the human world, or we're gonna step into an intergalactic world. 50 years ago, when we first started getting sightings of extraterrestrials, we thought that they might be real, and there was a real conversation in culture. And then culture stopped the conversation. It was too dangerous to the materialist paradigm of science. The notion that there were actually other tribes, other people's life all through the galaxy became a crazy idea. When I was growing up, if you talked about UFOs, you were crazy. That was a fringe phenomena. But actually, in all of the great traditions, there was always a knowing in the great religions of a broader sense of life all through the galaxy. So in the lineage that I grew up in, that was a given that there actually were interactions between the galaxies. And there's actually a text in the book of Genesis which talks about lovemaking between the daughters of men and the sons of gods who fell to the earth. And there's many sources, and I mentioned last week that my friend Sean Hargens has done work on this from his perspective, and in the beautiful work he's doing about the exo, the exo world. And, and I grew up in this, the lineages that talked about the intergalactic love story. And together with my, my, my beautiful partner, Zach Stein, we're talking about homo amor as an expression, not of a unit, a universal love story. It's not just the universal love story. It's the cosmos love story, which is why we call the new story of value cosmoerotic humanism, cosmoerotic. It's an intergalactic love story. But this is critical because we have two choices before us. As we expand into the new world, either there's going to be intergalactic war. Think about Star Wars, which is science fiction, 
portraying intergalactic war, or we're going to realize that the force of Eros actually animates all of cosmos, and that actually we can see each other. We can actually, in a world that's filled with life, and in the last five years, the realization that the world is filled with life has actually entered mainstream culture. The New York Times has run a dozen stories. Mainstream presses all over the world are running stories about the genuine reality or genuine possibility of the reality. The best explanation we have for the data of there being a world, not just this world, but galaxies teeming with life. And the amount of data is actually unbelievable. It's undeniable. And it's entered the mainstream if you actually follow these kind of things. The last five years, there's been a major shift. So we're preparing for a galactic world. The galaxy is a love story. And if you think that's ridiculous, that means you're not following the data. That means you're, you're lost in superstition. The empirical data very clearly points in that direction. So we need to create a world in which the human beings model not ethno-humanist racism, not humanity as ethnocentric, but actually we need to see beyond ethnocentric. We need to be able to see each other. Jake and Atiri can look at each other in this intergalactic love story. And it's all about intergalactic love stories. Take a look at the movie called Starman with Jeff Bridges, 1984. It's an intergalactic love story. Take a look at the movie called Michael, I believe it's called, right? Produced by Sean Daniels, right? It's a beautiful movie. It's an intergalactic love story. There's a key Star Trek, which is the, the story of Spock and Kirk when they're young and how they meet and how their children meet. And if you read the story carefully, it tells the story of Spock's father who marries a human and it's an intergalactic love story. And last week we asked everyone, if you can, take a look at all the literature and send us examples that you found of an intergalactic love story. Because to be cosmocentric means that human beings on the one hand turn to the animal world and say, oh, there's love between humans and animals. Doesn't mean that humans and animals are the same. Doesn't mean humans aren't more evolved than animals. They are. And yet, take a look at the movie, My Octopus Teacher which is about how human beings and animals can actually love each other in a very particular way. We don't marry each other, right? Right. It's not about sexuality, but it's about love between those two worlds. But human beings and other species, human beings and Pandorans, actually, wow, they do make love. And actually the Jeff Bridges story, Starman, actually is Jeff Bridges, who is an alien, quote unquote, right, comes to earth and this beautiful love story and this beautiful lovemaking scene on a train, which births their son who will become a teacher. So we need to begin to think about this intergalactic love story. And to do that, we need to be able to say to each other, I see you. I love you. I see you. So I just want to do two minutes with you now, if you can. We're in the revolution now. We're in the revolution. And let's just understand, what does this mean? I love you. I see you. So let's think about it deeply together. What does it mean, right, to love, right? Let's, let's feel deeply, right? To love is to see through God's eyes. That's what it means to love. And to love God is to allow God or source or infinity to see through your eyes, right? To love God is allow, to allow God to see with your eyes, to uniquely see what can be seen from your perspective with your unique depth and your unique qualities, from that place you say, I see you. That's what it means to love God. Self-love is to see yourself, to know your own nature, to see your own unique self. And self-love is an enlightenment. And the nature of the universe is that it evolves. Life forms differentiate from earlier life forms and evolve an ever-increasing order of complexity and consciousness. And we know that complexity and consciousness are intimately related. They're the inside and the outside of the same evolutionary folding. And the more complex the physical organism, the more evolved are the inner capacities of consciousness of that same being. Right? A rabbit is more materially complex and more conscious than a snail. A human being is more materially complex and conscious than a dog. 
right? And so each original form provides original being with the unique experience of itself. Let me say that again. Each original form provides original being, God, source, with a new unique experience of itself. Because each original form can see in a new way, right? So an amoeba serves the divine with a particular experience of itself. A butterfly with another, a fish with yet another. A bird and a horse provide yet another experience in which the divine sees or experiences itself. But the human being is a quantum leap forward in consciousness. The human being, a complete human being, actually is a place in which actually the universe wakes up in this complete human being in this new way. Because when the human being loves, the human being is actually seeing consciously in a new way through God's eyes. That's what it means to love. To be a lover is to see through God's eyes. And when you see through God's eyes, then God can see through you. Wow. This requires you to shift perspective from that of your separate self-ego to your infinitely expansive, unique self. To love God is to let God see through your eyes. And the truth of love is that you can only love God or another human being through your eyes, your unique self, which are the eyes of God. And it's this realization that you have a unique perspective, a unique way of seeing, a unique I see you that obligates you to cleanse your doors of perception. And let God see through your eyes because only you can open that particular love in the world. You see with and as the eyes of God, only if you clarify the pettiness of your small self and you uncoil, we uncoil the self-contraction of the ego. It's only thus that God can see through the prism of your unique eyes. And that's why we're obligated, responsible. It's our great wild joy to clarify our doors of perception. Because any lack of wholeness on our part, any blindness on our part, any blurring in your unique perspective and perception obstructs the vision of God. If you cannot see clearly, you literally blind God. So your job, my job, is to become a unique self, a clarified unique self. Our job is to make ourselves so transparent to the divine, so open to the love intelligence that sees through us that God can see with our eyes. This is our gift to God. Because at the core, last step, my friends, this is the revolution. We're laying it down together, friends, heart open. Love at its core is not an emotion. Love at its core is to say, and we're going to see the song in a second, I can see clearly now. Love at its core is not an emotion. Love is a perception. Love is the ultimate verb. Love is not a noun. Love is a faculty of perception that allows you to see the inner nature of all that is. To love another human being is to see their true nature. To love is to perceive, to see the infinite specialness in divine beauty of the beloved, whether they're from the Navi people, whether it's the star man of Jeff Bridges, whether it's any other intergalactic love story, we need to lay the ground of the intergalactic love story that's coming. To be a lover is to see beyond the limited and distorted vision of your separate self-contraction or of your human contraction. Miles Quattridge, the colonel in Avatar 1, has a human contraction. He can't see. To, but to be a lover is to see with God's eyes. And, and the notion when we say God is infinity, infinity is all the galaxies. That's why the great religions actually understood, of course, of course, the galaxy is teeming with life because the galaxy is infinite divinity. It's the infinity of divine intimacy. How could it not be teeming with life? So to be a lover is to see with God's eyes. Your beloved is both your lover and all that is. And to be loved by another human being is to have your true nature seen. And your true nature is your unique self. Whether you're Natiri, right, or you're Spider, right, or you're Jake or your Loa, or your Anang, or your Tonawari, or your Ronal, or your Selfridge, or your Miles Quatridge. 
Like to be loved by a human being is your unique self is seen. Let's go one last step, my friends. To love God is to let God see through your eyes. To love God is to empower God with the vision of your unique perspective. And we live out of a passion for the divine. And the divine says, let me see through your eyes. Remember, grace says to Jake, see what they see. Infinity says, there's a way where I can see through you. Let me see through your eyes. We're called to see with God's eyes. And God says, I want to see through your eyes. We want to act with God's eyes, to react with God's eyes, to write your book of life with God's eyes as God would see from your perspective. And if you're successful in your life, success means success is not win-lose metrics. It's not rivalrous conflict. Success means that your perspective becomes available to God. Your perspective, your seeing finds God and feeds God. It gives God strength and joy. And you must consider, my friends, we must consider together that being in devotion is nothing but actually being God from a distinct perspective. Oh, my God. There's no true individuality, which is independent from the context of union. Mature individuality, to be a unique self, is not about being separate. Unique is not separate. To be a unique self is about having a distinct way of seeing in the context of union with the divine. And to be responsible for this perspective, for the seeing, is to declare the truth from this vantage point. But without making it the only perspective, I declare the truth from my point of seeing, but I don't make it the only point of seeing. I'm not attached to my point of seeing. I know the truth of my point of seeing, but I can actually take your perspective. And I can feel you and you can feel me. And we move beyond polarization. That's what it means to be a lover. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes. To love God is to let God see with your eyes.